Okay, uh, so uh, today we have Professor uh, Alexei Gorshkov um, from NIST and the University of Maryland. Um, so Professor Gorshkov, uh, he got his PhD uh, from Harvard in 2010, and then he was a Dubridge postdoctoral scholar at Caltech, after which he, has, he became a staff physicist at NIST, and he started his own research group at the University of Maryland. Um, so he is a fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute and the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science at Maryland. And he is a theorist. His theoretical research uh, spans quantum optics, atomic physics, condensed matter physics, and quantum information science. And he is responsible for a very, very wide variety of seminal results across multiple disciplines. Um, and his research, although he's a physicist, has found applications in topics that engineers care a lot about, in particular in quantum communication, quantum sensing, and even quantum computing. So he's also a recipient of the 2022 Optica Fellowship, uh, Arthur S. Fleming Award, APS Fellowship, because um, IUPAP Young Scientist, a large number of awards. So let's give him a hand and welcome him to our colloquium. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you guys hear me? It's working? Great. Well, Rahul, thank you so much for inviting me and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so I will talk today about uh, quantum sensor networks. And uh, so the talk is actually sort of pretty short. So I hope, uh, I mean, I hope you can ask questions. I asked Rahul if it's okay for people to ask questions. And he said it's up to me. So, uh, so please ask questions. It'll be more fun that way. Uh, and if nobody asks questions, I, I think we'll end early. So uh, which would be also good, I guess. Uh, okay. So uh, since I wasn't sure exactly what the audience is, I'll just have sort of one slide uh, on uh, quantum mechanics. So maybe some sort of students here would like a review. So uh, anyway, for those of you who are experts, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, at the, the very small scales, uh, the world around us obeys the uh, peculiar laws of quantum mechanics. And while a classical bit uh, can be in uh, two states, zero and one, like bits in our computers, a quantum bit or qubit can be in any superposition uh, of states uh, 0 and 1 uh, with a complex coefficients alpha and beta. So this is called a quantum superposition. Mathematically, uh, the state of a single qubit is a vector in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, perhaps the uh, simplest example is an electron spin, which can be uh, up, down, or uh, any uh, a quantum superposition uh, of up and down. Now, the most general uh, uh, two, two qubit state is a superposition of the four uh, classical uh, basis states. And so if we ignore the uh, overall normalization and the uh, unimportance uh, of the overall phase, then we need uh, four complex numbers to describe such two qubit state. So one example of a two qubit state is this theta 0, 1, minus 1, 0, or in the language of the electron spin, uh, up, down, minus down, up. Uh, and the amazing thing about this state is uh, uh, if we try to measure our two qubits or two spins, we will only always find these uh, two spins uh, pointing in the opposite direction. But until we make the measurement, uh, neither we nor, in fact, uh, anybody else uh, will know uh, what that direction is. Uh, and the, such uh, correlations that are peculiar to quantum mechanics and they're, they're, that are not present in classical mechanics are called uh, entanglement. If you have a 500 qubits, uh, then you need a, a 2 to the 500 complex numbers to specify the most general state. And this number is larger than the number of atoms in the observable universe. Which means that if you want to do the most general computation, uh, kind of naively, uh, on such a uh, 500 qubit state, uh, you can't really do it. It's, it's intractable. Uh, and so it's very tempting uh, then to use uh, these uh, peculiar features of quantum mechanics, such as uh, quantum superpositions, or entanglement, or this uh, huge uh, Hilbert space, uh, to uh, create uh, quantum technologies. Uh, and indeed, uh, you can imagine that perhaps uh, by using uh, quantum superpositions, a quantum computer can, in some sense, uh, solve many problems uh, at the same time. And indeed, uh, because of this, uh, quantum computers are promising to give an exponential speed up over classical for, for some problems. Uh, another feature of quantum mechanics is the uh, non-cloning theorem, uh, which says that uh, uh, an unknown quantum state cannot be perfectly copied. In particular, 
This means that a, a secret quantum message cannot be perfectly copied, which uh, allows a, a quantum communication to be a, a unbreakably secure. Finally, uh, as we will discuss uh, at length uh, in this talk, uh, because of entanglement, quantum sensing turns out uh, uh, can uh, have uh, increased sensitivity compared to uh, uh, classical or, or unentangled uh, sensing. But we'll discuss this in more detail. Uh, and now, uh, in order to build uh, these uh, and other uh, quantum technologies, one needs to understand and control quantum systems, as well as uh, perhaps uh, design new ones. And this quest altogether uh, can be called uh, quantum engineering. Now, uh, the main challenge uh, in uh, designing, uh, understanding, and controlling quantum systems is that uh, uh, on the one hand, you need to protect uh, these quantum systems from the environment, because quantum effects are very fragile, um, and so you need to protect them from the environment. But at the same time, you need to be able to control this quantum system. And these two uh, uh, requirements, you can see, are you know, uh, almost a little bit contradictory to each other. So it's, it's hard to do that. Uh, in particular, because of this uh, uh, fragility of quantum effects, and because of the huge size of the uh, multi-qubit Hilbert space, uh, designing, understanding, and controlling large interacting quantum systems are, uh, is, is most challenging and fascinating. And that's why uh, sort of a lot of theorists and experimentalists uh, are working on this. So it's a very exciting field. Uh, so today, again, uh, we'll talk about uh, quantum sensing. Uh, so what are quantum sensors? Uh, quantum sensors are sensors that uh, make somehow fundamental, uh, uh, important uh, use of quantum for sensing. Uh, and I will explain how they work uh, in the next slide, but let me first give you some uh, uh, examples. Uh, because quantum sensors are small, as you will see in the examples uh, in this slide, uh, because they're small, they, they give rise to uh, often to high spatial resolution. But also, all measurements uh, in physics are fundamentally limited by the laws of quantum mechanics. And as a result, quantum sensors also give rise to, uh, to high precision. So here's a, one example uh, of a quantum sensor, uh, nitrogen vacancy uh, uh, color center in diamond, which can be used for magnetometry and thermometry. So this uh, NV center uh, is made by uh, removing uh, two carbons from the diamond lattice, uh, leaving one of the sites empty, uh, a vacancy here, and uh, replacing the other one uh, with a nitrogen. And it turns out that the resulting defect can be roughly thought of as an electronic spin. Uh, and then the uh, energy splitting, uh, splittings of this uh, electronic spin can depend uh, on the magnetic field and the temperature. And then by measuring this uh, splitting, uh, you can uh, use this uh, NV center as a magnetometer or a thermometer. Uh, and it has indeed been used, for example, for uh, magnetic imaging of live bacteria uh, and nanoscale thermometry of live human cells. So another example uh, of a uh, quantum sensor is a Rydberg atom. So a Rydberg atom is a, uh, is a highly excited atom where the outer electron uh, you know, is highly excited above its uh, uh, lowest state. Uh, and because it's highly excited, it's far away from the positively charged core. Uh, and so this negatively charged electron and this positively charged core form a large uh, electric dipole, which is very sensitive uh, to electric fields, which uh, allows these Rydberg atoms to be uh, uh, very good uh, electrometers. Uh, so here is another uh, amazing uh, quantum sensor just from a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, past year. Um, and the group of Junyi, what, uh, what they did is the following. So, um, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, theory of general relativity says that two clocks uh, that are at different gravitational potentials actually uh, tick with slightly different rates, uh, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is an effect that's called the uh, gravitational redshift. And what uh, Jun Yi did in his experiments, he had uh, strontium atoms uh, that are trapped here in different pancakes. So these dots are strontium atoms, and they're trapped here in these pancakes. The overall system is about a millimeter, and each of the atoms uh, is a little clock. And what they, they were able to do is they were able to measure the difference in the gravitational redshift between uh, these uh, atoms that are spaced by only a millimeter, which is uh, you know, truly, truly remarkable. 
So, so quantum sensors are, uh, yep. You were talking about the uh, Freiburg atom? And so, how, the, on the, previous the Rydberg atom, yep. Yeah. yeah, so is that something you can do with any element, or does it require certain uh, properties? Of yeah, you can do it with any element. So, uh, so any element, uh, you know, you can excite the electron uh, high up. Uh, and then, uh, miraculously, you would expect that these high-lying states, you would expect that maybe uh, they will decay very quickly, but it actually turns out to be the opposite. The, the, the more highly excited they are, the more long-lived they are. So it's really a, kind of a very nice system. Um, and it's good not only for sensing, it's also very good for quantum computing, which is very popular these days. Yeah? So like a single, single electron in the outer shell, no matter how many there will be? Uh, well, you, you, you can have a, say, uh, if you have a, so, so this picture here is for uh, maybe uh, for, uh, say, uh, atoms in the, uh, in the first column of the periodic table, like rubidium, where there's only one outer electron. If you have two outer electrons, you would typically excite only one of them up. Uh, but you can also consider exciting too. Uh, all of this is possible, yeah. Thank you for the question. More questions? So for this measurement, is this a quantum 1.0 or quantum 2.0, right? Say it again. Uh, so for this measurement, is this a quantum 1.0 or quantum 2.0 version? It seems to me it's very, very precise. Yeah, this is just a really, really precise clock. So uh, what they're able to do is uh, uh, they're, they're able to measure kind of, uh, well, as I will explain, I mean, in the next slide, how all of these measurements are done. But they're basically measuring an energy difference between uh, uh, two atomic levels. Um, and they're making this uh, uh, measurement to a precision that's about uh, one part uh, in, in 10 to the 20th. So, uh, you know, uh, you just change this frequency by a uh, one part in 10 to the 20th, and they can see the difference. And this really precise measurement allows them to see that you know, uh, this atom uh, you know, has a slightly different frequency uh, you know, than that atom because of this gravitational redshift. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can call it a quantum 1.0. I mean, it's individual atoms. You're just making a really, really precise uh, single atom clock. OK. So, uh, so now let me uh, tell you, sort of this was just uh, some pictures, so now let me tell you, uh, again, in a very, very simple uh, 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 language, how a quantum sensor works. So uh, consider a two-level atom uh, or a two-level system with uh, uh, eigenstates uh, that are labeled by 1 and 0. So uh, you can think of 0 as the uh, kind of the 1, 0 state in our two-dimensional Hilbert space, and, uh, and 1 is the 0, 1. Uh, is the second uh, uh, vector. And now, let's suppose that the Hamiltonian of the system, which, which is the energy of the system, is a 1 half times theta times z. So theta here will be our parameter of interest. z is the Pauli z matrix. Um, and you can immediately see that uh, this Hamiltonian is diagonal uh, in this computational basis 0, 1. And theta is just the, uh, the energy difference between 0 and 1. So, uh, so one of the eigenstates is energy plus 1 half theta, and the other one is minus 1 half theta. So what we're really asking ourselves is, what is the energy difference between states 0 and 1? And that's how exactly the clock worked, for example. That's also how the uh, NV magnetometer works. You know, this energy difference is sensitive to magnetic fields. So the way you would do this measurement is you would prepare the state uh, uh, 0 plus 1, and you would just let this state evolve under this Hamiltonian. And because 0 and 1 have different energy, so you let it evolve under the Hamiltonian. That's how uh, evolution works. Um, what happens is that the state uh, zero, the states 0 and 1 pick up a relative phase, uh, theta t, relative to each other. Um, and then what we do is we measure uh, an observable that is the x poly matrix. And the way measurements, again, in quantum mechanics work is a uh, uh, you project your uh, state, which is this state, onto the eigenstates of x, which is 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1, uh, with the probability given by the overlap of this eigenstate uh, with the wave function. So the probability of getting the state plus, you know, you can do this calculation, and you find that it's actually cosine squared theta t over 2. So at t equal to 0, uh, indeed it's 1, because we start exactly with the state 0 plus 1. And then p minus is just 1 minus that. The sum of the, them is 1. And at this point, you're really uh, kind of done uh, with your quantum mechanics. What you have is a, uh, is a random variable x, 
whose uh, probability distribution, uh, this p plus and p minus, depends on theta. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to sample this random variable and use these samples to extract uh, what theta is. Um, and so uh, uh, a, a famous uh, quantity uh, in statistics that encodes uh, how much information uh, a random variable x has about a, a parameter, carries about a parameter theta is called the Fisher information. So it's defined uh, like this. So we sum over the two possible outcomes here, plus and minus, and compute uh, this quantity. So it turns out that the larger, uh, you know, the more sensitive uh, the random variable is to a parameter theta, the larger this quantity is, the more information uh, the random variable carries uh, about the parameter theta. And to see this, you just notice this uh, uh, derivative. So the, the faster uh, these probabilities, p plus and p minus, change with, th with, with theta, the larger this derivative is, and so the larger is the Fisher information. Uh, and there's this famous uh, uh, Kramer-Rau bound that says that uh, a single measurement uh, of, the, uh, um, uh, of this random variable x allows you to uh, determine theta with an uncertainty uh, that is not better, uh, not smaller than one over the square root of the Fisher information. Now, of course, in reality, a single measurement of this random variable x uh, gives you only one bit of information, which is not enough to determine theta to any uh, uh, you know, useful precision. So what you uh, do in reality is you measure theta many times. Um, so you do many runs of many runs m of the experiment. Then the Fisher information just gets multiplied by m. And so you get a, a, this type of bound. Uh, and then the limit of large m, you can in fact saturate uh, this uh, inequality with a, a maximum likelihood estimator. But uh, I don't want to be carrying this m uh, kind of throughout the talk. So for simplicity, I will work in the m equals 1 case. But just keep in mind that we would usually have to do uh, many, uh, many runs m to achieve everything. But I will, for simplicity, work just with 1 over square root of f, kind of a single shot uh, bound. Yes? When you say many runs of m, do you mean a single, a single sensor over, over time? Or do you mean like yeah, just a single sensor, and I just repeat it uh, m times. Just repeat the same experiment m times. In the, in the previous time, we had the gravitational uh, sensor. So there, the, if I was to map it to this model, theta depends on the local gravitational Exactly. Uh, yeah, theta depends on local gravitational field. So t is something that you choose as an experiment. Yeah, time is something that you choose. Uh, uh, which you know uh, is usually limited by some you know uh, whatever whatever you have the lifetime of your atoms the, you know maybe the decoherence uh, uh, or something else yeah okay so uh, now let's plug in uh, our formulas for p plus and p minus into this expression you know you take the logarithm you take the derivative you square you sum uh, and what you get is actually something very simple you find that the Fisher information is just t squared. Um, and then we plug this t squared in here, and you find that your uncertainty uh, in measuring this parameter theta is just 1 over t. Uh, and uh, maybe that's uh, not too surprising, uh, uh, because indeed, if your time is, say, twice as long, uh, then you're somehow uh, uh, sensitive to uh, changes in theta that are half as small. Uh, so maybe that makes sense. Um, and so uh, for the remainder uh, of the talk, uh, you know, because you can saturate this in this large m limit, I will just assume that uh, for a single uh, two-level atom, the uh, uncertainty is, uh, is 1 over t. OK, so now let's suppose we have n sensors. Um, and let's suppose all n sensors are coupled to the same parameter theta. And we're trying to measure theta. So how can we do that? Well, one possibility is we can just use our n sensors independently. So we prepare each of them in the state 0 plus 1, and just run the protocol uh, from the previous slide in parallel on all n sensors. And then we just use the results of the measurements on all n sensors to compute our, uh, to compute our theta. And what we get is an improvement that's 1 over the square root of the number of sensors, which is just the standard statistical improvement for basically doing uh, n measurements. It's kind of the same as uh, I had in the previous slide. I had an m where you use the same sensor you know, m times. And now here I'm just using n of them independently in parallel. 
And this is called the standard quantum limit. However, there's actually another strategy. Uh, you can prepare this entangled state uh, 0, 0, 0, uh, you know, where every uh, uh, qubit is in state 0, plus the state where every qubit is in state 1. Uh, so you can call this state a cat state because the superposition of two uh, kind of very classical states, like a, like a Schrodinger cat, uh, which is kind of a superposition of being dead and alive. You can also call it a, a multi-particle GHZ state uh, for the experts, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. Uh, and what you see th is that uh, uh, these two states, uh, the all zero state and the all one state, they're both eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, uh, and they're split by an energy difference n theta. Uh, and so if you let this state evolve under this Hamiltonian, uh, th this state will pick up a relative phase uh, n theta t uh, relative to that state. Uh, and uh, um, you see that this problem is, uh, is very similar to the, uh, to the case of a, of a single parameter, except now there is this extra factor of n. So essentially, by the same calculation that we did uh, uh, for, a single, uh, for a single qubit, uh, not a single parameter, for a single qubit, um, we find that the uncertainty here that you can achieve is now 1 over Tn. And it turns out uh, you don't need to make some complicated entangled measurement to do it. You can just measure the individual x uh, uh, poly matrices on, the, uh, on our n qubits. And this will allow you to extract uh, this delta theta with this 1 over Tn uncertainty. So you see that we have a reduction from 1 over T root n to 1 over Tn by using entanglement. And the reason this happens is that, uh, uh, I don't know if this will help you, but uh, contributions to quantum noise from each sensor uh, conspire to partially cancel each other out you know, in this entangled state. And that's why you get this reduction. Uh, and this 1 over n scaling is called the Heisenberg limit. And you can actually prove that uh, it's the best possible measurement uh, allowed by quantum mechanics for this particular uh, situation. Yes? So how does this argument go in the presence of decoherence of a single qubit? Right, if right. you now have n, n qubits, right, you're you're probably also much more sensitive to decoherence of individual qubits. Exactly, right. Yes, this is sort of the, uh, the, the, the most uh, popular question. So in the, like, let's suppose that each qubit also decoheres with the rate gamma. And suppose you are not, I mean, suppose your, your parameter theta you know, doesn't change in time. You have as much time as sort of, you have some long time t to measure this. So the question is, uh, does it really help to use entanglement or not? Because uh, on the one hand, entanglement allows you to measure theta more precisely. But on the other hand, uh, this state actually uh, decoheres n times faster uh, than uh, these individual states. And so in that case, it happens to be a wash. Uh, so it doesn't help. Um, however, there are situations where using entanglement helps. In particular, suppose this theta changes in time. And it changes in time on a scale faster than your decoherence rate gamma. And then you really need to make your measurement quickly. Uh, and so, uh, so in that case, uh, in that case, it helps. So it helps basically kind of with the bandwidth of your measurement in some sense. Can I ask a follow-up? Yep. Can we, can we somehow engineer the way that entanglement, that the entangled state looks in time to make us uh, resistant to certain sorts of decoherence, right? I'm just thinking, like in a single qubit case, you know, you can do echoes and things like that, right? Uh, can we do similar tricks? Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, there is an entire, right, there is an entire field of sort of uh, basically a kind of quantum error correction for, for quantum sensing. Um, I mean, I'll mention some references towards the end, but you can definitely do this. You can be very clever. You can uh, create states that are kind of sensitive to the thing you want to be sensitive to, but, uh, you know, kind of minimally sensitive to whatever noise you have. Um, yeah, it's a whole exciting field. Yeah, very good question. Thanks, Max. More questions? Yeah? Uh, wouldn't, uh, so kind of before I was talking about one sensor and now you're talking about multiple, wouldn't that mean, mean that um, like the other limit is that you're, you want your measurement to be as local as possible, like physically? So Say it again, you want, uh, you want, like for the quantum sensor, you typically a lot of applications want, the, want you to have like one sensor in one very precise location. Is there, like once you have multiple sensors, isn't that another limit is that you don't want to have too many sensors so that you I mean, it depends. That's a good question, right? So, uh, uh, like one example where kind of this picture would be useful is suppose you're trying to uh, maybe uh, build a clock, uh, 
And maybe, uh, maybe you're in a situation where you know, uh, like you're not worried about this difference in height. Uh, maybe like, I don't know, maybe all of your atoms are kind of in the same plate, they're plane, they're same height above the ground. So then, uh, well, you'll have a better clock uh, the more atoms you have. Um, and so uh, you could either, either use these atoms you know, uh, uh, independently, and then you would get a 1 over t root n, or you could entangle them, and then you'll have a better clock. Um, so uh, it, it also depends, uh, I mean, suppose you're measuring a magnetic field, uh, and maybe uh, uh, your magnetic field is, uh, you know, maybe you're not interested in a very uh, kind of uh, small spatial variations of the magnetic field. Maybe it's a uniform magnetic field. So then again, you know, put more atoms in there, uh, and then if you entangle them, it's better than if you don't entangle them. Of course, if you're interested in something that's uh, that cha in a signal that changes in space very, very quickly, uh, yeah, then uh, you're probably better off using a single one. Um, and we'll talk about some of this stuff uh, later. Uh, good question. Okay. Right. So, uh, so, so far, we considered the case where we had only one parameter, and it was coupled to all the qubits. But now, let's suppose we have n different parameters, theta 1 through theta n, and each of them is coupled to its own uh, qubit. I mean, sort of like what you were asking. Uh, uh, but now, let's suppose that instead of being interested in measuring every single one of these thetas, suppose we're interested in measuring only one desired uh, linear combination of them, so uh, given by these coefficients alpha. So here's a cartoon of what we could be interested in. Suppose we have uh, four uh, sensors inside a cell, um, and uh, each sensor has a, a field, uh, theta i, which is unknown. Um, it could be, uh, for example, an electromagnetic field or, or temperature. And then also each sensor has an assigned weight to it uh, that we pick. Uh, and then we want to measure this linear combination. Now, for simplicity, uh, I will assume that these weights are real, uh, although you can also uh, extend it to complex weights. So why would you care about doing this, uh, about measuring a linear combination? Well, it can help you target uh, some uh, spatial profile of the desired signal, like these alphas could be, uh, I don't know, uh, phases, in which case uh, um, you could be interested in computing some Fourier mode of your uh, signal, or maybe a, a spherical harmonic of your signal. Or maybe uh, the signal you're interested in is kind of uh, 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 stronger on one side of the cell or in the periphery of the cell. And you can encode your question basically uh, uh, into these coefficients alpha. Uh, so so what can, how, can we, uh, how can we make this measurement? So one possibility, again, is let's not use entanglement. So let's uh, uh, measure every theta i uh, without using entanglement. Then let's just compute this uh, linear combination. So, uh, so then we uh, assume that uh, on each qubit we make this optimal measurement with uncertainty 1 over t. Uh, and then we compute q. And then the uncertainty in computing that q is just uh, given by the square root of the uh, kind of weighted uh, uncertainties of individual uh, measurements. So we plug in a 1 over t here for each delta theta. And we just get uh, an expression like this. So that's without using entanglement. Uh, and now uh, it turns out that with entanglement, uh, you know, the answer is non-trivial. Uh, so we use a, uh, because it's a multi-parameter problem, now instead of having a, a Fisher information, we have, it turns out we need to use a Fisher information matrix. And then we need to uh, use the corresponding sort of generalization uh, of the chromer rao bound and some previous work. And then what we find is the following. So it's uh, with entanglement, it turns out the uncertainty is lower bounded uh, by basically uh, the largest alpha, uh, and then still divided by t. Uh, and maybe sort of in, in, in the following slides, maybe it'll become a little bit more clear why it's like that. Yeah, but for now, just trust me. Uh, so again, it's simply given by the uncertainty from the single site with the largest alpha. And let's see uh, you know, what this means, just to make sure that at least it sort of makes sense. Suppose uh, our alpha 1 is equal to 1 and all the other alphas are 0, which means that we're just interested in measuring theta 1. So we plug in alpha 1 equal to 1 here, and everything else is 0. We get 1 over t. And then the largest alpha is 1, so we again get 1 over t. So good. If we're just interested in measuring theta 1 of a single site, uh, entanglement doesn't help, you know, uh, which makes sense. Like The other sites are kind of useless. The other qubits are useless. 
On the other hand, let's suppose we're interested in measuring the average of these thetas. So each alpha i is equal to 1 over n. Uh, so then we uh, plug in 1 over n here. So we get a 1 over n squared, uh, n times. So it uh, becomes 1 over n, and then square root. So we get 1 over t root n, which is the standard quantum limit that we uh, uh, kind of uh, saw before. On the other hand, with entanglement, you know, you plug this in here and you get a, the largest n is 1 over n. Uh, the largest alpha is 1 over n. And so you get 1 over tn. And this is indeed the, uh, the Heisenberg limit that we've also seen. And now what this formula does, it allows you to really uh, kind of uh, uh, interpolate and find out what the optimum is uh, for any kind of uh, linear combination. Yeah? Yeah, uh, very good question. So uh, uh, we will, I will discuss that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Right, so so far it's just a bound. But uh, what Rahul is asking, but how are you, I mean, is it saturable? Maybe it's not even a tight bound. Um, and, uh, you know, and if it's a tight bound, you know, what's the protocol for saturating this bound? Um, so let's find that protocol. Right, so, uh, so let's assume uh, uh, without loss of generality that these alphas, first of all, I'll assume they're all non-negative. Um, and there are ways of uh, effectively changing the sign of alpha by uh, applying some pi pulses, uh, which map z to minus z. But it's a detail. You can just assume that uh, all the alphas are non-negative. And furthermore, let's assume that the largest one of them is equal to 1. And that's very easy to achieve. You know, I can just uh, divide this q by the... Uh, by the absolute value of the largest alpha. Uh, and then you know, I can sort of take care of this normalization later. So let's assume all the alphas are non-negative and the largest one is equal to 1. And then I will show what the optimal protocol is. So uh, we start with the initial state, which is the same, our favorite uh, cat state. Uh, and what we do is, in some sense, uh, we evolve the qubit i under this Hamiltonian for a time that's proportional to alpha i. So here's what I mean by that. So let's suppose, suppose we have three qubits, so uh, n is equal to 3. Uh, this is kind of the time here for the first qubit, time for the second qubit, and time for the third qubit. The final time is t. Uh, and then I mark here uh, some other times, alpha 1t and alpha 2t. And then what I assume is that uh, during this uh, first period of time from 0 to alpha 1t, our Hamiltonian is the whole thing. So all three qubits are coupled to their parameters theta. Then I assume that during the second time interval, I somehow decouple uh, my first qubit from its parameter theta 1. So either I assume I can really do this, maybe I'll just like, remove our qubit you know, from the uh, uh, environment, uh, from, kind of from the field, uh, or I can imagine I move the state of my internal state of my qubit to some state that's not sensitive uh, to the field, or I can even uh, you know, apply kind of a pi pulse here uh, halfway through, the, uh, through this uh, a red interval to kind of evolve uh, under positive uh, theta 1 and then under negative theta 1. So just assume that the qubit, uh, qubit 1 is decoupled from the field during this uh, red time. And then I, during this third time interval, I assume that uh, only the third qubit is coupled uh, uh, to the parameters. So I decouple both qubits 1 and 2 from their parameters. And now what you see is that uh, um, uh, the, um, the, so theta 1 uh, is then active for a time alpha 1t, theta 2 is active for a time uh, alpha 2t, and theta 3 is active for the full time t. So the relative phase that's picked up is given kind of by all of these green lines together. So it's given by this expression where this thing right here is exactly q that we're interested in. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, you know, if we follow this protocol, we just again get the same as sort of cat state with a relative phase. And then uh, it's sufficient to just measure, like before, it's sufficient to measure just the uh, x uh, uh, poly matrix on, on every qubit. And so, and so if I were to just, ah, but OK, that would be individual. So the reason why you can't do it one at a time is because then you'll get just one by root n. Or yes, one. yes. So, uh, so yeah, it's important that uh, it's all happening together uh, in this uh, GHG state, I mean, this cat state. Right, so as I said, you know, it's sufficient, again, to measure this parity. I mean, individual x's and then compute the parity. Um, and then what we get is, a, because it's i, q, t, uh, what we get is a 1 over t. And because I assume that my largest alpha is 1, uh, it turns out it's exactly uh, this formula that I said. It's the largest alpha divided by t. So uh, it's a very simple protocol. Yep. You're trying to measure q here, not the individual 
individual. Exactly, exactly. We will not get access to the, to the individual ones. And in fact, uh, if you wanted to know uh, all the thetas, um, then uh, it's known that the entanglement, entanglement actually doesn't help. Yeah. You mean how do you prove that? Or um, uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. So this is this is the general protocol for these. Uh, but you, in, in kind of describing it, you said removing removing uh, a sensor from the field. Um, but like it, that, uh, what's the, what's a the mechanism that can be done for doing that? Um, is that the coherence, or is that some other? No, no, I mean, you can imagine that and you really, really like, pick it up and like, remove it really quickly. Uh, I don't know, it's your NV center like, some, and some nano diamond, just remove that nano diamond. Or like, you, you wouldn't do this, this is too slow. Normally what you would do is, uh, you know, as I said, you imagine there are some other internal states in your you know, NV center or your atom, uh, and maybe these other states are not sensitive to that field. So you just kind of transfer your internal state of the atom uh, or your center from a state that's sensitive to the field to a state that's not sensitive. Or another approach is you just uh, switch your states 0 and 1 halfway through this de red dashed line. So if you switch states 0 and 1, then at whatever phase you pick up this way, you just undo half, uh, like on the other half. Uh, so there are lots of ways to achieving this. Yeah? <laughs> Does that rely strongly on the individual that's being commuting? Like yes, yes, it relies a lot on the fact that uh, these Zs commute. So uh, I will, uh, on the Outlook slide, I'll mention, uh, you know, we're also writing a non-commuting paper. There are also lots of other non-commuting papers, things that are very, very different. So if, uh, if one of these Zs, for example, if there's like a Z1 and the other parameter couples to X1, very different story. So but then is the, is the lower bound the same or the lower bound the same? Uh, I think it's different, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, right. So uh, uh, so what we found in this case is the best, uh, like fastest or more, more, most precise uh, measurement allowed by quantum mechanics for this particular problem. It turns out that this measurement is in some sense secure uh, as long as we control at least one of these qubits, one of these nodes. Uh, eavesdroppers have no information about the measurement result. Um, and also, uh, like one thing I could mention is you can uh, optimally combine data from different types of sensors. So you can imagine that maybe a theta one, you know, depends on the electric field uh, on sensor one. You know, theta two depends on the magnetic field of sensor two, and theta three depends on the temperature, of, you know, at sensor three. Okay. Well, I'm wondering what you mean by eavesdroppers. Yeah, this, I, yeah, so uh, like you imagine, um, suppose there are three sensors, you know, I have one, you know, you have one, and Rahul has one, uh, and maybe, you know, I don't trust you, so uh, as long as you don't find out, and then we, all three of us just make, uh, you know, measurements, I make a measurement of my X1, you know, you make a measurement of X2, and you make a measurement of X3, as long as you don't know, you know, what I've measured, you know, uh, you will not be able to learn basically anything about this quantity Q, uh, because, uh, Kind of uh, the, the answer is in the total parity, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, unless you give me your answers, I will also not be able to know anything. So it's it's a little silly, but uh, anyway. Yeah, so don't pay it too much attention to it. Yep. So do you think uh, this method could be used like in hard drive storage? You measure three different magnetic locations at the same time. Or like that? Um. Right, so um, that's a good question. So uh, let's see. Um, right, so maybe, uh, um, yeah, so somehow. Presumably combined with encoding too, so you've written the magnetic bits probably Yeah, so the question is how, I mean, first of all, how, how, how do you measure them normally? Like, how do you measure them right now? I guess I'm not an expert, so uh, what is the, like, what is the sensor that you use for reading out your hard drive right now? What is the, uh, how does it work? Yeah, so I guess the first question is, uh, like, is, is that measurement, like, is the sensor right now quantum or not? I mean, maybe that sensor right now is actually a sort of a classical sensor. 
Uh, sure, sure. No, but like indiv an individual sensor, like is it a? Um, yeah. Well, maybe let's uh, let's talk about. It. I mean, I think it's a very good question, right? Um, Right. Okay. Yeah. So if it's, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a quantum sensor, then you can definitely imagine, you know, uh, entangling it uh, and asking, you know, and asking some collective question about, you know, your three bits uh, in the hard drive, uh, and kind of answering this collective question about these three bits somewhat faster than you could do without it. Although, I mean, it's. It sounds like a lot of work, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, you'll need to be entangling your sensors. And you'll waste time entangling them, so maybe whatever you win by, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a, but it's a good, great question. I haven't heard that one before. Cool. Okay. So, uh, so, so far we did this linear combination. Now let's generalize. So suppose instead of measuring a linear combination of these thetas, we want to measure any desired analytic function. So uh, we also found the optimal protocol for doing this, and actually it's, it's super simple. So what we do is we uh, uh, spend a negligible fraction of the total time to measure individual uh, theta i without using entanglement to get some estimates that I call theta i tilde. And we spend a negligible time, uh, fraction of time doing this. Then we uh, linearize our function q around these estimates. So this is just the value of uh, q at the estimates plus the uh, uh, linear term uh, and the difference between the true values and the estimates. And then we drop the higher order terms. Um, and then we can use the optimal linear combination protocol to measure the linear correction. And it turns out that if you cleverly chose this uh, negligible fraction of time, these higher order terms are, are, are actually negligible. Uh, and you get the, uh, the optimal protocol for measuring this arbitrary analytic function. Get max it's so optimal in T and it's optimal in N. But then there must be some assumption on the data that is not going up with N. Um, there are some, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, analytic. Yeah, but the N is not the function because we sequence a function, right? So the derivative would be between the N or the N function of N variables. Right? If I take Q is theta 1 to the power N times theta 2, does that even work? Um, because then the error is not destroyed. I guess, so I'm thinking of it as a single function, and then uh, I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm trying to check whether, um, yeah, you're saying uh, it can, it's not a single function. It must be a sequence of functions. Yeah, maybe there's some assumption there. Okay, good question. Maybe we'll, let's talk about this later. Um, yeah. Um, I'm curious to know what you're optimizing here, because you, you, you simply talked about individual sensors eating one over t, uh, like for, for as far as the accuracy, but then, like, yeah, I, I, what do you mean by negligible fraction of the time? Individual what? Sorry. Negligible fraction. What, what, what do you mean by negligible fraction? Yes. Yeah, so I have, a, I have a total time t, and I can do with my total time t anything I want. So what I do is uh, I, you know, I take some uh, small fraction of it, which is actually t to some power, like maybe square root of t, for example, like roughly. So it's uh, like as t goes to infinity, this becomes you know, a negligible fraction of time. And then I use this negligible fraction of time to measure, to, and I don't use entanglement. I just measure theta 1 you know, to get some estimate theta 1 tilde, theta n to get an estimate theta n tilde. And after that, I use the remainder of my time to do this entangled measurement of a linear combination. You have, you have a sensitivity based on how much time you spend measuring. Yes, so, yes. So that, that, that factors into it. Yes, yes, it factors into it. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's a little bit surprising. So you know, if this time is too short, then these uh, estimates will be really bad. And so then the, uh, the second order term that I dropped here you know, will be too big. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it has to be not too big and not too small. But turns out it works out. Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, so technically we're at 45 minutes, but I guess uh, uh, since we're doing questions as we go, I mean, we'll just. Uh. OK, so let's generalize a little bit further. So um, um, yeah, I don't have that much left, honestly. So uh, um, so, uh, so so far, we consider that our parameters are coupled directly to the field, uh, to, to, the, to the qubits. Um, that's what we just did. 
And now let's generalize. So let's assume we have a vector k of unknown parameters, theta 1 through theta k. And let's suppose instead of directly coupled to the qubits, there are some functions fi of, this, uh, of these theta k that are coupled to the qubits. And then we're interested in measuring some function of these parameters theta, which is not you know, directly written as a function of these fi's. So it's a generalization. We assume that you know, q is given. We assume that these functions fi are given. But of course, we don't know what the thetas are. Furthermore, let's assume that we have enough of these sensors. So I, I assume I have d sensors and k parameters. I assume I have enough sensors to, in principle, measure uh, the entire vector theta. So roughly, this means that the number of sensors is greater than or equal to the number of parameters. So like, if I don't worry about how quickly I do it, I assume I have uh, enough uh, sensors to, in principle, measure every theta. And now, uh, the point is that uh, if there are many sensors, if d is uh, larger than k, that I can't dire directly use uh, the earlier results because there are infinitely many ways to uh, express this function q in terms of fi. There's only one way to express it in terms of theta, but if there are lots of different fi's, if this d is large, there are lots of ways of expressing uh, q in terms of f's. So uh, like, say if these are all linear, you know, what's the linear combination that I should use? Um, yeah, and this is the problem that we solved. I mean, it turns out there's an optimal linear combination to use if they are linear. And if they're not linear, you can expand again and linearize, and sort of the same thing works. So you want to find what the fi's are given. Fi's are given. Uh, the, form, the form of fi's are given. So I know the function, yeah. functional form of fi in terms of theta, but I don't know what the thetas are. And I know the function q, uh, like the f functional form of q, but I don't know what, where it's evaluated at. Uh, and again, the same thing. So I don't want to measure the individual thetas. I just want to know q. So it's kind of a, a same setup. So why would you care? Right, so we found the optimal protocol. So why would you want to do this? So here's a cartoon. So uh, let's suppose we have a, a box in two dimensions. Um, and uh, inside the box, I have a unit electric charges. Uh, so here's one electric charge. It has a, an unknown x coordinate and an unknown y coordinate. And here's another electric charge. It also has an unknown x coordinate and an unknown y coordinate. I call them you know, r together, x and y. So I have uh, uh, four unknown numbers, the x and y coordinates of the two charges. And then let's suppose that the fi are z components of the electric field that's at the sensor i. So here's one sensor, another sensor, and like three more sensors. So I have five sensors. Um, and so I have uh, uh, five different functions of these uh, four unknown coordinates. So in principle, I have enough information from these five sensors. You know, if I measure these f's really precisely, I could compute where my charges are. But suppose I don't want to do it uh, you know, like this. I want to do it as quickly as possible and to answer one particular question. So the question I want to answer is, uh, what is the z component of the electric field at this position right here? And because it's inside the box, I suppose that I'm not allowed to put a sensor there. So uh, I somehow want to compute this using the measurements of these sensors as quickly as possible without necessarily having to learn where these charges are. So I want to compute it indirectly. Uh, right. And Q can also be an integral of the field over some region. Um, like it doesn't have to be a, the value of the field at one particular place. Um, like another example, instead of electric charges, you can imagine, say, nuclear spins that are producing a magnetic field. And maybe uh, we're trying to learn the structure of some molecule. Um, you know, that sits on top of the surface of a diamond, and we're using this diamond magnetometer to, to study something about the structure of this molecule. Um, so I keep going? Is it? OK. I mean, I can stop anytime. So, um, OK, maybe I have like two, one, no, maybe two more slides. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, another, another, another uh, sort of comment is the following. So, uh, so far, for all of these protocols that I described, as long as, like in this linear combination case, for example, as long as all these alphas were non-zero, I always assume, right, I always assume that I started with this cat state where all n qubits were entangled. Uh, and as Max pointed out, you know, they, uh, they decay, these uh, kind of cat states, they decay very quickly. So the question is, can we somehow reduce the amount of entanglement, at least for some choices of alpha, uh, uh, you know, so I don't have to use like these uh, maximally entangled states and still get the optimal answer. Um, 
because highly entangled states, they're hard to create and they decohere fast, as Max said. Uh, so can we achieve the same uh, optimal measurement by tangling, entangling fewer qubits? And the answer turns out to be yes uh, uh, in some, for some choices of alpha. And the trick is the following. So uh, we divide our total time in fractions pn, such that the sum of these fractions is 1. Uh, so we prepare some uh, you know, superposition, you know, kind of like this cat state, uh, but it doesn't have to be this cat state. You prepare some superposition of two states. Uh, uh, and then we uh, coherently switch between different states, i n and psi n prime, during different uh, fractions of time uh, n. And then this total phase just keeps accumulating. Uh, and what we can do is we don't have to always use these maximally entangled states. Like, for example, for one pair of these states, you know, the last qubit can, for example, be in state 0 in both of these guys. And then it will not be maximally entangled anymore. The last qubit can be disentangled. And then we cleverly choose these states psi n and these fractions pn in such a way that we still get the optimal measurement, but we're no longer using uh, uh, this maximally entangled state. And in particular, the result that we have is that uh, if a, a particular condition is satisfied, which I will explain in a second, we can achieve the optimal measurement with at most a k partite entanglement where k doesn't necessarily have to be the full n. So here's what this condition is. Uh, so it depends on uh, what alpha is. Uh, and depending on what the alphas are, you know, uh, different values of k can allow us to uh, satisfy this inequality. So let's suppose that uh, uh, alpha 1 is equal to 1 and the rest of the alphas are 0. So we're only interested in measuring theta 1. So then on the left-hand side, we have the sum of all the alphas, that's 1. On the right-hand side, we have the largest alpha, that's also 1. So we can satisfy this inequality with k equals to 1. So one partite entanglement is enough, obviously. If we're just interested in measuring only theta 1, we don't need to use any entanglement. Well, that's good. Uh, if, on the other hand, we're interested in measuring the average, so each alpha is 1 over n, uh, so then uh, on the left-hand side, we have a 1 over n, n times, so that's 1. And on the right-hand side, we have 1 over n. So the only way to satisfy this is to make k equal to n. So if we're interested in measuring the average, I mean, tough luck. I mean, we really need to use full n partite entanglement, which is maybe sort of intuitively clear. Well, and then for any, uh, anything sort of in between these two extreme cases, you know, uh, you might be able to uh, uh, satisfy this with a k that's smaller than n. OK, and then the last, uh, the last slide is uh, measuring multiple functions. So suppose we want to measure not a single linear combination, but m different linear combinations. So we haven't fully solved this problem. Um, I guess a hard problem, um, but we sort of made some uh, progress. So suppose we want to uh, minimize the sum of the variances of the m estimators. So now we have these m estimators, uh, sort of m things we want to measure, and we have m estimators, and we want to minimize the sum of their variances. So here are some possible uh, strategies. One is uh, uh, we can use just the local entanglement free protocol. So measure each theta 1 and then compute my different uh, linear combinations. Another possibility is I break my time into fractions, and I spend the first fraction of time measuring Q1 using my linear combination protocol, the second fraction of time measuring Q2, et cetera. And then the third possibility is I can sequentially measure other, not necessarily this, but some other optimally chosen linear combinations. And then from those, I compute the Qs. And what we find, it turns out in many cases, especially when the number of senses is large, uh, you know, uh, this works best. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if the number of things you're interested in learning is equal to the number of sensors, like none of this is useful. Uh, just don't use entanglement. So this, this only works you know, uh, in certain cases. Uh, OK, I think that's it. So uh, I mean, briefly, sort of applications, you can imagine using this at small scales or at large scales. Like you can measure structures of molecules or uh, you know, um, fields uh, inside a, a cell or inside a human um, with applications in chemistry, biology, and medicine for measuring magnetic fields, electric fields, and temperature. Or you can imagine working on large scales, uh, the scale of the Earth or a scale of a volcano. Um, and then you can uh, imagine applications in geodesy and geophysics, uh, again, for measuring magnetic fields, electric fields, uh, temperature, gravity, et cetera. 
So to summarize, we found uh, often optimal entanglement-based protocols for measuring uh, one or more properties of spatially varying fields. And there are lots of exciting things uh, you know, uh, to think about. And there are a lot of people who are thinking about it, already made some progress on. You can think about uh, what, are the, uh, what are the optimal locations of sensors, you know, uh, given you know, after you know what the optimal performance is at every given location. So you want to optimize sensor location. Um, to Max's question, you know, there's a lot of work on, a, on error correction. So uh, suppose there's some decoherence. How do you optimally find this decoherence and do your measurement in the uh, best possible way at the same time? Uh, Rahul asked about non-commuting generators. There's a lot of work on this, and we're also thinking about this. Um, how about measuring properties of time varying, uh, including uh, stochastic fields? Um, what if the sensors are allowed to move during the measurement? Um, something else that's interesting is to consider verified or encrypted measurements, where verified means that somehow uh, some server is running the measurements for you, and you maybe don't trust that server, uh, and you want to make sure they give you the answer that you want and not something else, and also perhaps uh, uh, they don't even know what question you're asking them. Uh, so that would be the encrypted part. And finally, uh, sort of, I considered qubits, but really the same ideas apply to, uh, to bosonic fields, such as photons or phonons, where in the case of uh, bosonic fields, you can imagine that the parameters are coupled to your, uh, uh, to your fields like this. So this will be like a phase plate uh, or refractive index, and this will be like a displacement of your bosonic field. And you can ask all of the same questions, work out kind of all of the theory, and in this case, there are even uh, some recent experiments. I'll just briefly flash them and uh, stop. So, uh, so there was this experiment where, uh, uh, with optical photons, they considered measuring the average of four different phases. These are just phase plates, phases phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. And you can prepare some uh, entangled state of light here on the left, send it through these phases, and then make uh, uh, measurements and measure uh, this uh, average phase better than a you know, uh, without entanglement. And there was a similar measurement uh, using radio frequency photons, where now, instead of uh, making phase measurements, you measure uh, displacements uh, in phase space. So alpha 1 through alpha m are displacements in phase space. So let me uh, thank uh, like various collaborators uh, over the years who worked with me on this uh, uh, topic. Let me thank some funding agencies and some past and current uh, group members, and thank you for your attention. Uh, okay, maybe one more question, if anyone has any. We already had a lot of questions. Okay, I think we're out of time anyways. So. Great, okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. It was great, thanks.